Hi guys, in this video, I wanna to talk to you about boundaries. And this is a topic that a lot of my clients bring up. A lot of people bring up in the comments as well. And I wanna show you in this video how to set the right boundaries and what the wrong boundaries look like. Basically, boundaries are like a tool. It's like a weapon. You can either use it for good or bad. And I wanna make sure that you don't fall into the major pitfalls that a lot of my clients have fallen into as well and set the right boundaries in a relationship and look at boundaries in a correct way as well. In case you're new to the channel, guys, my name is Jeffrey and I help men in long-term relationships or in marriages with the right skills and knowledge to be able to design a thriving relationship on your own. So if you want more content on this topic, be sure to subscribe to this channel and also click the bell button as well to be notified when I post new videos every single week. And before I begin this video too, I also want to let you know that the masterclass on the five proven steps to rebuilding your relationship from the ground up is still open. So if you want to join me in that masterclass or if you want to submit your application for the Relationships Revival Program, then be sure to stick around to the very end of this video for the announcement on how you can join both those things. So the first point that I wanna make here is I want you to start seeing boundaries like a tool. And I think a lot of people are asking the wrong questions when it comes to boundaries. The question is not whether you should set boundaries or not, but the real question should be, how should I use it? Same thing as looking at it as a tool or a weapon. I have a tool or a weapon here. The question is not, should I use it? Definitely you should use it, but it's a matter of how. So boundaries in and of itself, is not necessarily a good thing or bad thing. It's a matter of how you use it. And I'm gonna show you a screenshot here of my clients who use the boundaries in the wrong way and realizes that, ooh, it's actually backfired on him very, very hard. So I wanna start this by talking to you about the three toxic types of boundaries that you wanna avoid at all costs. Number one is what we call the avoidance boundaries. And these are boundaries that are set to avoid bad behavior. And it's usually set in a very reactive way when one or both persons does something bad in a relationship. And we set this avoidance type boundaries because we hope that by telling people what to avoid, we can also coach them on what to do instead. And there are really five reasons why these types of boundaries can be very damaging. One, they're often done in a very reactive way. So again, when one or both persons have done something bad in a relationship or something not so good, we tend to use it in a very reactive way. And we do this in a very emotional way, often from a very defensive state. And when we set this avoidance boundaries from a defensive state like this, it makes the other person very defensive. And this is how arguments, fights, and just resistance and defense mechanisms start to come out. The other thing I want you to think about too is that when you set this avoidance type boundaries, I want you to think about the implication that you give to your partner here. What we need to understand here, guys, is that avoidance boundaries are like setting contracts. And contracts set the lowest level of acceptable behavior that you want to take. Contracts don't tell you what to do, but they tell you what not to do. This is the line that you cannot cross. So to help you understand this, let's use the analogy of business, for example. Let's say I hired someone, an employee, and I always need to remind them um, of the avoidance boundaries all the time and remind them of the contract all the time. Well, the implication I'm giving to that person is that that person is so messed up and they're always like threatening to cross those boundary lines that there's something gravely wrong with them. And if that's an assumption you're making guys, you're gonna make the other person very defensive, very guarded. And even if the boundary was correct, the other person being defensive, they will just reject what you say outright. They're gonna be in a very guarded, in a very defensive state. And they're not gonna be open-minded and listen to what you're actually saying. And the third thing guys is that telling someone how to not do something doesn't actually coach them in any way. It doesn't actually add clarity in any way. And a good example of this is, let's say you're trying to ride a bike. I don't teach someone how to ride a bike by telling them how to not ride a bike. It's a very inefficient and very confusing way to do it. Same thing here. If you want to teach someone how to do something with a better way to act, don't do it by telling them the 10 ways of how not to do it, right? It doesn't actually add any clarity. Number four is that it can become quite overwhelming and quite constrictive. So again, imagine if you onboarded someone to a new company, to your company as a business, and instead of telling them, here's our culture, here's what we want to do, here's what we value, you tell them, here's what we don't value, here's what not to do. And you give a long laundry list of it. That can become very constrictive, very overwhelming very quickly, and doesn't create a very good environment. Which brings me to number five is that it creates a lot of politics, a lot of tension, a lot of negativity, and it just doesn't set that relationship up to be a very good relationship. And it usually ends up destroying a lot of safety, which we know creates a lot of just downward spiral from there as well. Number two is what we call the easy way out boundaries. And these are the boundaries that you set when you have a conflict, for example, and you set these boundaries to quickly resolve those issues without really exploring the intentions from both sides. 
And these can include like the my way or the highway boundaries where let's say your partner does something that you don't approve of and you say, you know what, no exceptions, you shouldn't do this. You're not allowed to do this. You can't do this. What's wrong with you? This includes the I don't care what, no exceptions kind of boundaries, the I don't have time for this boundaries. Basically, these are boundaries you set in a very reactive way that is often designed to save time, to save energy, to, and you are trying to control that person to do a certain thing because you want to avoid the having the discussion, the deep discussion, to actually understand both sides completely before setting the boundaries. So again, this doesn't work because like, think about the subtle message you're giving to your partner here that I don't really care about what you think, the underlying reasons behind what you think, I just care about mine. And so if it doesn't benefit me, if I can't see how it benefits me, then you must be wrong and I must be right. And so when you do this a lot, it's gonna be very hard for your partner to feel like a part of a team. This is also how safety is destroyed because you're not making anyone feel understood here. And so you can imagine if you do this a lot too, this can create a culture where your partner may not bring stuff up to you any longer because she learns that whenever she does something based on what she thinks is correct, you might totally misinterpret that, misunderstand that and try to shut her down in a way. And so she starts to keep more things to herself, which creates this culture of having more misunderstandings, having more miscommunications, etc. as well. And number three is what we call the non-mutual boundaries. And so these are boundaries that are set where you are setting a boundary that feels right to you, that fits your own desires, your own needs, your own vision of what you can do or what you want to do, etc. But you don't really explore what your partner's vision is, what your partner's goals are, etc. So again, the subtle message you're giving to your partner here again is that her needs, her desires, her goals, her vision doesn't really matter. It's your goals, it's your vision. It's all about what you want, right? If there is some culture, there's something, some process that's happening in the relationship that doesn't fit you, you don't care about whether that fits her or not, whether that helps her or not, it's what fits you. And you expect her to do something, to follow what you say, because it benefits you and you don't really care about whether that's of inconvenience to her or not, that's difficult for her or not, et cetera. And so again, it doesn't make your partner feel like a part of a team. It cultivates also a culture of conflicting goals where it's all about my way and her way. You're just clashing where you're saying like, well, this is what works for me, this is what works for me and they don't fit, they clash and you just have to understand how to settle, how to live with those conflicting goals. This is how couples grow apart as well because you were never having an opportunity to really understand the underlying reasons, the underlying intentions, the underlying thoughts behind someone's actions here. So again, these are the three types of boundaries that you should avoid at all costs, guys. So before I move forward here, guys, leave a comment below. Do you feel like you have done any of these three toxic boundaries before? And give me some examples of how you've set these toxic boundaries in your own relationship. And I think you'll find that you've done this a lot more than we think because of all the old ways, the program ways that we've been program to see how we're supposed to set boundaries in a relationship. So if those are the three toxic boundaries, then what are the kinds of boundaries that we want to set? Now, there are really five principles behind great boundaries. And number one is that you need to define what to do and not what not to do, what to avoid. Defining a thousand ways not to do something doesn't really help. And often we do this in a very reactive way, which doesn't really help as well. So it helps that whenever you think about all the things that you don't want your partner to do, try to reverse it antithetically reverse it and ask yourself, what would you like to be done instead? And have the conversation focus around that. Not only is this more effective, more efficient, just like the example we gave with teaching someone how to ride a bike, for example, but it's also a lot more positive and you find that people will be a lot more open to discussing boundaries, to discussing the right behavior, to admitting their own mistakes even, when you approach it this way. And number two is that it also needs to be based on deep and mutually aligned goals as well. Not boundaries that are personal or selfish, that it's only fitting you, what helps you, but also helps your partner and the unit as a whole. So without mutually aligned goals, guys, your boundaries are always gonna be selfish. It's not something that you do deliberately, but naturally when you don't have aligned goals, when you don't understand what the other person needs or wants or et cetera, whatever boundaries you set will always be personal and selfish. It creates this culture of every man for himself, like we said, and it's also what creates a sensation where you can never align and mutually agree on boundaries. Because again, the boundary that you're trying to set doesn't really fit what your partner wants. And so your partner can say with her words, yeah, I'll follow it, but she's gonna be following it very reluctantly. It's not gonna be lasting very long because there's no buy-in there. And so when I used to do this a lot, when I set um, these kind of very selfish boundaries like this, we would argue about petty or irrelevant issues very often because we lose sight of the main goal here and we're just arguing about petty stuff that doesn't really matter. Sometimes we say to ourselves like, how do we even 
argue about this, this is how it happens. Because here we're arguing from a very different set of values, from a different set of goals, from a different set of thinking, different set of intentions, philosophies, etc. And it's what creates this defensiveness. So if you are discussing boundaries a lot, and every time you discuss boundaries, it creates a lot of tension, it creates a lot of defensiveness, bitterness, this is usually what happens is that you haven't aligned on your goals yet. But when you have aligned goals first, discussing boundaries becomes a lot easier. So for example, when I'm discussing boundaries for my team, for example, when I'm setting what is the right behavior in this context of the team, we always uh, align it to what is the goal? What is the highest goal again? What are we trying to achieve here? And so this no longer becomes a case of me versus you. You know, a lot of times when we talk about boundaries of me versus you, but more of me and you versus the problem, which is a very, very different dynamic in a relationship. Number three, good boundaries also honors and investigates both persons' deep intentions, deep thoughts, deep values, etc. behind the actions. So most people create boundaries that are often very action-based. Don't do this action or do this action, but it's all action-based. But the thing you have to understand is that the intentions actually matter more than the actions. And a great example of this is I can give a million bucks to charity, for example, out of altruism or out of some selfish desire to get some PR, for example. Right? The same action, but depending on my intentions there, that will color whether my actions are good or bad. Same thing for boundaries. Sometimes when we set action type boundaries and we forget to investigate the deeper intentions, we risk making the mistake of misunderstanding the intentions behind that. And we could find ourselves avoiding or stopping behaviors that could actually be bred out of good intentions that are actually good because we fail to understand the intentions behind it. You know, a great example of this too was sometimes my partner would not tell me something. And that would be a live omission in a lot of respects. And that action, objectively speaking, can sound really, really bad. But once I investigated her reasons of why she didn't tell me this thing, and it was to protect me, it was to save me from more stress, for example, it was to save me from uh, distracting myself from work. Then once I understood those intentions, I started to understand, ooh, if I have set the boundary to tell her, for example, hey, you need to tell me everything. You need to tell me, like, you can't keep anything from me. Then I'm also killing that intention behind it, the good intention that she has behind it. So if we do not honor this, if we do not investigate this underlying motives first, the risk of ourselves setting the wreck boundaries or the bad boundaries that will wreak a lot of havoc will be very, very high as well. So with my employees, my partner, for example, before I set avoidance boundaries, before I set boundaries even, I always try to investigate what is the underlying motive, what is the underlying reason, and I always make room for that in the conversation first because once I do that, I often find that the boundary that I thought I had in mind was actually not correct the whole time. Good boundaries should always be based on mutual buy-in. It never should be imposed or never should be threatened, never should be controlling. So most people, what happens is when their partner, let's say, does something bad, they create what we call one-way boundaries where you say, no, that's not acceptable. No matter what, I don't really care. Do it my way or we break up or consequences, right? And so in that case, our partner will probably agree with it, but they haven't really bought into it emotionally. And so you might find that they might do it for a day, two days, a week, but they can never follow through. So if you're struggling to get buy-in, if you're struggling to get consistency in both of you following the boundaries, then what you're missing usually is this mutual buy-in. So for example, in my uh, relationship, in my business, for example, before I coach someone, before I teach someone, before I set a boundary, and before I walk away from the conversation, I'm always asking them, okay, what do you think about that? And I really allow an environment where my partner, the person I'm setting the boundaries to, can say no, can object me, can negate me. Because I want to understand what are the blockers from you buying into this? And maybe there's something that I'm missing, I fail to understand about your premises, your values, your motives. That conversation can go into more investigation of what the motives are, which eventually leads to me tweaking and changing my idea of what the boundary is supposed to be so that she can get bought into it as well. And number five is that boundaries should be few but principled, not many. You shouldn't be creating thousands, hundreds of boundaries that become very overwhelming. And a lot of people, when they learn about the value of creating boundaries, they can get very boundary happy. They just create boundaries left and right because they think that's a tool to actually enrich their relationship. So again, those are the five key principles to creating healthy boundaries, guys. If you have any questions, any comments, leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. But now the question goes, well, what are the steps then to actually create these healthy mutual boundaries. What are the steps to do that? And I teach these five steps in a program. Uh, this is a very in-depth process, so I can't 
you know, go too deep into it here, but I can outline for you the basic steps of how you can do this. So number one is that I want you to learn how to align on the macro vision. And to help you align on this, to help you understand what this macro vision is, in our program, we give people the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basically, what we're saying is that any decision, any action you have, the motivation behind that is to get one of these five things. So for example, if you watch the client story with Spencer Davis, he was having a hard time uh, discussing with his partner about whether they want to have more kids or no more kids. And so when you investigate the deeper underlying motives behind that, they realize that what she wants is not really more children, but really that she wants to feel that maternal figure again, like she's cultivating something, she's letting something grow, she's nurturing something. And that's more fulfilling her, her esteem needs, for example, her self-actualization needs, for example. So behind every action, behind every desire, guys, know that it's just us humans trying to fulfill one of these five basic human needs. And so once you align yourself on this, you will realize that both of you, while you have a different how, different idea of how you achieve these five things, you basically fundamentally want the same five things. And so when you align yourself on these things and you realize that, hey, both of us just want the same things, that's a major, major step to actually aligning on your goals. So once you align on these macro goals down to its deeper score, the next you want to align on the micro goal. Okay, so let's say you both want to get esteem needs, to fulfill your esteem needs, to fulfill whatever needs in the hierarchy of needs. Now the problem is that right now both of you have very different views, very different ideas, very different values that guide how you're going to fulfill that. Now the thing is that in my experience with watching my clients, if you can align on this what, which is the macro goal, then aligning on the micro goals becomes a lot easier, especially if you have the aid of the frameworks, the internal shifts, etc., where you can think and discuss and talk and guide the conversation in a healthy place to find that alignment. And the next step here is to define the desired action, guys. And so in this case, a lot of people, the problem with a lot of people's approach is that they see this as an opportunity to define what they think the desired action should be, what they think is the right thing to do. So if you think about these goals, let me tell you how to get to these goals. Well, you already know how to get to those goals. Now, your job is to understand what is my partner's. So here we're trying to bring back this concept of being antithetic and looking at not what you know, but what do you not know? What are you missing? What is her side of the story? What is the other side? And once you define the desired action, you want to then understand and dive deeper into the intentions behind the desired action. So for example, the desired action here for my partner was, oh, live omission, don't tell Jeff this thing. Then I want to investigate, okay, why? What is the underlying reasons, the underlying motives behind that? Because again, the actions are not good or bad, it's the intentions that color the actions. And here's where the frameworks and the internal shifts really matter because things like antithetic mind, for example, coming from this true and compassionate place, being able to guide the conversation properly, being non-judgmental, going multiple layers deep with the frameworks, that's when all this will start to matter big time. And once you understand these underlying motives, then usually like a thunderbolt, the right boundary, the right thing to do, the right next step should become very, very clear to you. If it's not clear to you, that means that you've been missing some of these steps up above. But once it becomes clear to you, then you want to present it in a soft way where you're asking for buy-in instead of just imposing it on your partner here. And this is an iterative process, right? Once you present the soft suggestion and you ask your partner, for example, what do you think about that? And you get a rejection on that, then your job is to go back up to the above stages because odds are good that you missed something from the previous stages. And once you go back to the previous stages, you realize that, oh, I missed some things here and there, and here's how I can redefine what that next step boundary should be. And with that definition, if that gets rejected again, you repeat that cycle until you get a mutual buy-in to say, okay, that's a good idea. And so that's why I always say goal alignment is always very possible. And boundaries, finding the right boundaries that you can, can mutually buy into is also very, very possible. And as my clients go through this, guys, and when I went through this as well, you realize that both of you are actually more similar, more single-minded, more similar-minded than you think you are. So if you want to see some client stories, some inspiration of how this plays out in real life setting, I would encourage you to watch all my client stories over on this side here. But for now, understand that there's a lot of prerequisites to be able to do this properly. Have a lot of admiration for each other. And to do that, you need to have a lot of safety. To do that, you need to understand the frameworks, the internal shifts like untethering, bulletproof vest, identity shifting, etc. You need to master all these prerequisites before you can even set the goals of aligning on the macro goals, aligning on the micro goals, etc. So if you want to get a system, 
and learn the system that can allow you to teach you all these prerequisites that you need to actually ultimately get to the point where you can set boundaries healthily in your relationship. And I want you to join me in my masterclass on the five prudent steps to rebuilding your relationship from the ground up. In the masterclass, I'll show you the exact steps all my clients have used to get in from the brink of a divorce to where they are today, which is in a thriving state right now. So if you want to join that masterclass, guys, you can click the link up in my head, also down below this video. But for now, guys, I'll leave you just two other videos with more knowledge and skills to allow you to design a thriving relationship on your own. For now, guys, I'll see you in the next video.